We are in Ruth chapter 3. We're going to be reading verses 8 through 9. And open up your Bibles, get your devices, get your phones, and I'd love for you to participate with me. This is our public reading of the Word of God together. I am reading from the New King James translation. And so let's read the Word of God together with strength and with passion and enthusiasm. Ruth chapter 3 and verse 8. Now it happened at midnight that the man was startled, and he turned to himself, and there a woman was lying at his feet. And Boaz said, Who are you? So she answered, I am Ruth, your maidservant. Take your maidservant under your wing, for you are a close relative. Then he said, Blessed are you of the Lord, my daughter, for you have shown more kindness at the end than at the beginning in that you did not go after young men, whether they were poor or rich. And now, my daughter, do not fear. Somebody needs to hear that. I will do for you all that you request, for all the people of my town know that you are a virtuous woman. May the Lord just add a blessing to the reading of his word. Amen. 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 You may be seated. And what I want to do is take this experience between Boaz and Ruth And I want to give you some life-changing principles when it comes to biblical dating. That's right. We're going to be talking about relationships between unmarried men and women. We're going to talk about biblical dating. And you're saying, well, listen, I can check out because I'm I'm not single. I'm married. Well, no, stay with us because there's something for you as well. Amen. These are not just ordinary principles that we're going to deal with. These are divine principles, and therefore, there are things that you can learn from these principles. Even though we're focusing on those who are unmarried, there are things you can learn between a husband and wife relationship, between a parent and an adult child relationship, in family relationships, and friendship relationships. These are powerful biblical principles for relationships that guarantee you life change so that you can be successful in this whole thing called relationship. This is not the type of stuff that you're going to see on the reality dating shows, okay? You're not going to see this on The Bachelor, okay? You're not going to see this on Love at at First Sight and all. No, you're not going to see it on those shows. You're going to see some things of what God says as to how we're supposed to conduct ourselves in relationships and the blessings that come as a result of that. And so what we've just read is that the first time here is when Ruth and Boaz, for the very first time, are able to be alone together and acknowledge that they have a romantic interest in one another. I mean, it's a big time moment, and some of us understand that moment. We've been in that moment because this culminates in Boaz and Ruth getting married. And their encounter was not the social norm, the way they went about getting to know one another. But they both, here's what they had. They were trusting in the Lord. They were obeying the Lord in the process. And so they did not miss their opportunity when God provided. They trusted in the Lord with all their hearts. And I want to say to you, it's so important that as you engage relationships, married or not married, that you you engage them with an obedience to God to handle relationships the way God calls us to handle relationships. So they trusted in the Lord with all their hearts, and they leaned not on their own understanding. In all their ways, they were acknowledging the Lord, and God directed their path. Come on, somebody. They had a number of differences between the two of them, so much so that it seemed that they should have never come together. This really shouldn't have worked. But they were both, can I remind you again, trusting in the Lord. They were both obeying the Lord in this process, and so they did not miss their opportunity when God provided for them. They did not miss their shot. Amen? Come on now. They were successful as singles in their relationship that ended up in this beautiful marriage. Not only that, a beautiful family. Not only that, a beautiful legacy. And so, my unmarried brothers and sisters, God wants you to be successful in dating. But you have to cling to biblical principles. Oh, let me say that again. God wants you to be successful as you engage the opposite sex with the goal of possibly finding your mate, but you have to not conform to this world. I mean, there's so much that we are kind of adopting in the kingdom way of life that comes straight from the world. There's no biblical precedent for it. It's not God's way. We're just kind of doing things the way the world does them, and when we get bad results, we're surprised. But guess what? When we do things the way the world does, we're going to get dark results. When we do things the way the world does, we're going to get just excessive disappointment. 
We're going to get hurt. We're going to get damaging results. And I think all the way back, and it's been a while, y'all, when I was unmarried, when I was single, the young, adult, young adult navigating my way through that, and it was hard. Can I say it again? It was hard. It's a, it's a, it's a tough situation. You know, you're just trying to keep yourself pure as a Christian man. You are trying to just navigate through so many different relationships and who's the right person. You're trying to really be true to God. And then you have people and just all ulterior motives. And it was hard. I remember going through one period when I was a single young man. And I basically said, okay, Lord, maybe you're calling me not to marry. That did not last long, okay? That, that moved re- I moved past that real fast, okay? <laughs> But it was just so frustrating at times that I just wanted to disengage with that whole game, that whole world, and just say, hey, Lord, it can be me me and you. Of course, that's not my gifting, amen? And so I needed a wife, and so, but but God did not call me to that. But what I'm trying to say, it can be very hard. And somebody asked me recently, they say, Pastor, do you think it's harder for unmarried people today than it was for your, when you were unmarried? Absolutely. I mean, it's a whole different, it's the wild, wild west out there. <laughs> Quite frankly, single folks, I'm scared for y'all. I pray for y'all. Because y'all, y'all don't know what y'all getting, man. I mean, I'm just saying, it was different for me, man. I, you don't know who you talk, you don't know who you DM, and you don't, somebody will catfish you. You don't know what you doing with. But God wants you to know that he can give you victory in relationships and really give you what you need. Now, he may not give you what you want, may not give you what you desire, but God will give you what you need to have the relationships that you need. And we ought to be looking for that as married folks as well as single folks, because single folks, you ought to be tired of relationships that don't result in marriage. You ought to be tired of getting your feelings hurt in relationships. You ought to be sick and tired of sleeping around with anybody and everybody and anything. You ought to be tired of compromising your standards. You ought to be tired of living with that emptiness and that shame that you feel after you sin, and now you got to start all over again. And God says to the unmarried person, when you walk with me in your singleness, I will give you success in your relationships. And so God has something for us here as we begin to delve into this. Just say that God's got something for me. Yeah, whether you're married or you're single, just go ahead and touch yourself and say, God's got something for me. If you're online, just put in the chat, God's got something for me. God's got something for all of us here. Now, there was a brand new store that was opened in New York City, and it was called the Husband's Store. (laughs) A very creative store, a very successful store, because it's where a woman could go to find a husband. But when the woman came into the store, there were certain rules she had to adhere to, very, very strict, careful rules that she had to adhere to in order to get a husband. First of all, she had to carefully make sure that she visit the store only once. You only get one shot, ladies. So you want to be on your best. You want to be rested. You want to be focused. You want to know what you're looking for. There are six floors in this store, and the value of the products increase. They seem to increase as you go to the next level, as you go to the next floor. And you can decide to choose any floor that you land on that you like, but you cannot go back to a previous floor if you move beyond that floor. And so the first floor, when you get into this store, the first floor, when the elevator doors open, this floor is comprised of men who have jobs. Yeah, that's a big deal, eh, amen. You can't take that for granted. (laughs) And you're tempted to stay, but, but the woman who got on it this particular day, she didn't stay on that floor. She went on to the next floor, and she went to the second floor, and when the elevator doors opened, this was the floor that had men who had jobs, and then there's an add on they love kids. Oh, oh, yeah. She said, I, I got to keep going. If, if, if it gets better, I just got to keep going. And so she went to the third floor. And when the elevator doors opened, these were men who had jobs. They loved kids. And they were extremely good looking. Oh, my goodness. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Now, she was tempted just to stay right there. I mean, because, listen, 
this is real good. But she said, maybe there's something even better for me. And so she went on to the fourth floor, and when the elevator door opened, these were men who had jobs, loved kids, drop dead fine, they looked good, and then they enjoyed helping around the house. She about to lose her mind at this point up in here, up in here, but she can't help herself. She say, I'm going to the fifth floor and see what's up there. So she decides to go to the fifth floor and the elevator door is open. And when she gets out, these are men. They have jobs. They love kids. They're super handsome. They help with the housework. And they're really good at being romantic. Oh, my Lord. Woo! Woo! It's getting hot up in here. At this point, everything in her told her, let me just stay right here because if I leave this floor, I know I can't come back to it and I can't really imagine things being any better than this, but I can't help myself. My curiosity is going to make me go up to the sixth floor. And so she went up to the sixth floor and when the elevator doors opened, there was nothing there. <laughs> Except for a big sign. And the big sign said, congratulations, you are visitor number 31,456,000 to the sixth floor. There are no men on this floor. This floor exists solely as proof that we always want a little bit more, no matter how good it gets. Thank you for shopping at the husband store. Now, of course, there was an outcry and the store owners had to create another store for men right across the street called the Wife Store. And they created the Wife Store, okay? And when the men would go in there on the first floor, there were wives that were stunningly beautiful. And then they'd go to the second floor, and the wives were not only stunningly beautiful, but they loved sex. Don't act like men, that doesn't excite you. Stop it, just, just don't even try it. On the third floor, their wives were stunningly beautiful and they loved sex and their wives never nagged them and always encouraged them. Come on, men. Come on now. But just like the women in the husband's store, the men would invariably go all the way up to the sixth floor because most of us always want a little bit more, no matter how good it gets. This message is all about helping you not to miss your floor. Can I get an amen from somebody? Turn to somebody and say, don't miss your floor. Don't miss your floor. This is my place to get off right here. Just turn to somebody and let them know. The first principle I want you to see that we can learn from Ruth and Boaz is that you as a single person, you have to walk in your purpose. Somebody say purpose. You have to walk in your purpose. Now, I want to remind you that Ruth is in Bethlehem with her mother-in-law, Naomi. I want to remind you that the way she got there is that as we read Ruth chapter 1 last week, that Elimelech and Naomi were married. They were Israelites. They were Jewish. And they had two sons, one named Malon, one named Chilion. But there was a famine in Bethlehem. And so as a result of that, they had to move over to Moab. He took his, Elimelech took his family on this long journey, relocated them so he could have food for them. In the process of living in Moab, Elimelech died. In the process of living in Moab, not only did Elimelech die, but Malon and Chilion, the two sons, they took wives from Moabite, the Moabite women. Malon married Ruth. And then in the process of them being there in Moab, Malon and Chilion died. And so now all that's left in Moab is Naomi, the mother, mother-in-law, and, and Orpah and Ruth. And so Naomi decides she's an older woman. She's up in age and she's grieving. She decides she's going to go back to Bethlehem. The famine has lifted and she's going to go back. She charges those two young women, Orpah and Ruth, don't come with me. Stay here in Moab where you'll probably be able to find a husband. If you come back with me to Bethlehem, you may not be able to find one. She literally pleads with them not to come back, but they come with her anyway. And then she finally turns around, gives them one more charge, 
and Orpah decides not to go any further, but Ruth says, I want to stay with you. Please don't ask me again to leave you. For where you go, I'm going to go. Where you live, I'm going to live. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. She makes this amazing covenant commitment to the relationship with Naomi, and not only Naomi, but with the Jewish people, even though Ruth's a Moabite, and more importantly, with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so now you fast forward, and they are in Bethlehem, and there's a situation now where Ruth has settled in with Naomi, and she is trying to find work to take care of her mother-in-law. And I want to I submit to you that Ruth was focused on walking in her purpose. In fact, both Boaz and Ruth knew what their purpose were. See, sometimes when you're not married, you begin to think, I really can't fulfill my purpose until I get married. And here's what you have to understand, that if you are not married, that your life is not on hold until you get married. Your life is not in the waiting room until you get married. If you are single, if you are unmarried, you need to know that God says he has plans for you today. God says, I know the plans I have for you. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. You need to know that you are a whole person single person. Today, in fact, I don't even like using the term single. I prefer to use unmarried because to me that defines you a little bit better, defines a person a little bit better because what does that mean? You've got all different types of people who are walking through singleness. You have widows. You have single parents. You, you have people who are single because of divorce. You have people who have never been married. It's just, just a whole world there, a whole universe. And just to kind of simplify that by saying single and making it seem like they're isolated and alone is not a fair word, word to say. Anyway, they were in this situation and they both knew their purpose. And you need to understand that you have purpose and that you are a whole person walking in the whole plan of God for your life today. You are a single person. You are complete in Christ today. Why don't you say that with me? I am complete in Christ today. Why don't we say that again? I am in complete in Christ today. Don't let your marital status take you hostage and keep you from doing something that God wants you to do right now. In Ruth chapter 2, look at this. Turn over to Ruth chapter 2. And it says in verse 1 that Boaz was a man of great wealth. He had a great reputation in the community. He had great influence. And what you get from this is that Boaz seemed to have been living his life to the full. He had been working on what he was called to do. He knew what God had called him to do by way of his career, and so he was excelling by way of his personal development, by way of his spiritual development, because it's very clear as you read about Boaz in the book of Ruth that he was a godly man. He loved the Lord. In fact, when he showed up to his employees, he was an owner of a business. He had, he had supervisors under him, and he had employees under him. He had people working a field. When he showed up at his business, he showed up and he told his supervisors and his employees, he would greet them like this. He said, the Lord be with you. What kind of boss shows up like that? Bosses normally show up and say, hey, you better get my report to me or something like that. But he was a godly man. And I love this because Boaz was taking care of business. Men, we have to take care of business, amen? Boaz was preparing himself, amen? I, I believe that a man, once he hits 18 years old, he needs to be preparing himself in his 18 years through his 20s for his future. He needs to be preparing himself by way of career, finding a trade, learning how to make money, learn how to generate revenue, learn how to grow up and be responsible, learn how to take care of himself. These are formative years for a man. They're very developmental years for a man. So if you're in that season, don't throw that away. You're young, you've got energy, work hard as a man so you can be ready to take a wife so you can be ready to take care of family. You say, even if you don't get married, you still got to take care of family because as you mature as a man, you become part of the family man in your house. You may have to take care of your mother. You may have to take care of your father. So you want to be a man who is substantive, a man who's productive, a man who knows how to get things done, a man who's not afraid of work. Come on, somebody, help me with this. And Boaz was that kind of man. Boaz had never been married. And Boaz was probably an older man. But you can tell that Boaz had used his early years to do what he's supposed to do. He was productive. He had energy. He, he wasn't just sitting around in the basement playing video games. Can I get it like that? He was doing something with all of his heart. He wasn't saying, even though I know God wants me to do this, I can't start doing it until I get married. No. Boaz knew his God-ordained purpose. 
And Ruth was the same way. She was walking in her purpose. Because it says in verse 2, Ruth chapter 2, verse 2, that Ruth said to Naomi, let me go and do what I'm called to do in this season of my life, to take care of my mother-in-law. That's what I'm called to do right now. See, ladies, as you begin to read through this, this is so interesting, because Ruth was not obsessed in looking for a husband. In fact, based on what Naomi had told her as they were leaving Moab, Ruth knew that she probably would not get remarried if she went with Naomi. So she went there with realizing that this may jeopardize her of ever getting married. And I love this because if you watch this in verse 3, it says that Ruth happened to come to the field that belonged to Boaz. Happenstance, circumstance, coincidence. Now, we know that there really are no coincidence. There's only God's divine providence, amen? Coincidence is when God acts anonymously to bless us. Can I get an amen from somebody? And here's the takeaway here, back to Proverbs chapter 3, that when you obey the Lord as a single person, as a married person for that matter as well, when you obey the Lord and do things his way, you don't have to get all manipulative and all anxious. God will direct you. He'll do something. He'll order your steps. The Bible says the steps of a righteous person, they're ordered by the Lord. So you don't have to be putting forth all this human effort to try and do something. God will bring it to you. You just be faithful to walk in your purpose. It says she happened to come to the field that belonged to Boaz. She didn't even know what field she was in, and she didn't know that Boaz was what they called a close relative and he was qualified to be a kinsman redeemer, someone who could come in and he could basically purchase the inheritance of Elimelech, Naomi's husband, and as a result cover Naomi and as a result also marry Ruth. She didn't know any of that. She just was going to a field because the Jewish custom was in the fields that they would never glean to the edges. They would only glean the interior part and leave the edges for the poor for the orphans and for the widows. And that's a good thing. We ought to do that more today, amen? That's what I love, make Cleveland better. There are, we ought to leave some room to help somebody else beyond ourselves, amen? Because there's somebody, you say, well, I'm in a lot of trouble. There's somebody in more trouble than you, amen? You sitting up here with your shoes on and your clothes on, and you probably drove up in something. You're not doing as bad as you think you are, amen? Hey, guess what? Everybody in this room, whether you believe it or not, you are in the top 1% of wealthiest people in the world. Did you know that? In the world. I'm not talking about America, but in the world, you are in the top 1% wealthiest people. The vast majority of the world lives in abject poverty. And so Ruth comes up because she knows that Jewish custom is that she can glean at the edges and get some food for her and Naomi. But I love this because she wasn't scheming to try to get married. She wasn't planning. She wasn't on all the dating apps. She wasn't blowing up Tinder and trying to figure something. No, no, she, she wasn't doing none of that. She wasn't worried about finding a husband. Here's the word. You can stamp this word on this passage. She was content. I think we just talked about that in a song. I will be content in every circumstance. You are Jehovah Jireh more than enough. See, we sing stuff, man, but we have to really back up and interpret it and really break it down because what we're doing when we're worshiping God there is we're saying, God, you're going to take care of me. You may not give me what I want, but you're going to give me what I need. You may not give me the type of relationship I wanted, I dreamed of, I envisioned, but you're going to give me the relationships I need because God says he promises to put us in the right relationships that we need. And as human beings, we all need relationships. We all need somebody who loves us and accepts us. We need a place where we feel like we belong and we identify with. We all need some place where we can make a contribution and leave a mark. These are basic human experiences that we need to experience with other human beings. But Ruth is content. In fact, Later on in verse 23 of Ruth chapter 2, it says that Ruth went two months after she met Boaz where she didn't do anything to try to move the relationship along. She, she didn't do anything to try to get Boaz's attention. She didn't DM him. She didn't start posting special pictures. She didn't try and get his phone number to text him, none of that. No, two months. It talks about this in verse 23 and 24. From mid-April to mid-June, it was what they called the barley harvest and the wheat harvest. So ladies and men, Ruth was not thirsty. 
she wasn't overly aggressive. She didn't have this desperation vibe coming off of her. You know, she wasn't idolizing marriage. You got to understand something. Hey, single people, can I say something to you? Because, you know, we get into this place where I just want to be married. I just want to be married. I just want to be married. As many of you want to be married so bad, there's just as many married folks who want to get out of their marriages. Now, I'm not supposed to tell y'all that. I just kind of broke a code there. But I'm just trying to encourage you, okay? The issue with married folks as well as unmarried folks is contentment. And we all have to deal with that. God says, I want you to get to a place where you worship me, where you bring me glory. You say, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad. And what day is that? Any old day will do. <laughs> Any old day will do. You give me the details of it. It's not going to change me rejoicing and being glad. And see, I grew up in the South, and I grew up in the South where it was hot, Arkansas. I mean, it was really, really hot. And I remember these summers, and that we would be at my grandmother's in Hemlock Court. My grandmother, Peewee, we'd be at her projects. They didn't have air conditioner. They didn't have air conditioners in the winter. They didn't have no air conditioner. All they had were fans in the screen door. I remember being in the kitchen with my grandma, Peewee. And I don't know what she's thinking. It's July. It's hot. It's like 90 degrees. And the screen door is, uh, is, is, is there. And, of course, the door is open. She's got a fan there. But she's cooking fried chicken. Y'all know how hot it is to cook fried chicken? And she got the oven going. And she got me in there helping. They didn't call me Kevin back then. They called me Kevin, okay? That's South. They called me Kevin. Kevin, come help with this, boy. Come help with this. And we burn up and we help him. But here's what I noticed at the screen door. On the screen door, you had flies inside the kitchen on the screen door, and the flies are pressed up against the screen door trying to get out. <laughs> and then you had flies on the outside of the screen door pressing, trying to get in. Nobody's content. <laughs> Folks in marriage trying to get out. Folks out of marriage trying to get in. God says, be content with where you are. Come on now. She was operating her purpose. Now, let me ask you something. Is there some part of your purpose that you know you're supposed to move forward on, but you've been distracted with trying to get married? You are out of position. You're so consumed with what you want to see happen in your future that you can't get done what God wants you to do today. And let me tell you, you're missing windows of opportunities. You're missing windows of opportunity. I know you're dealing with discouragement. I know you're dealing with despair because you want this so, so much. But God says, I want you to begin to lay that before me and worship me and then ask me, God, ask me for a strength to get up and to take advantage of the opportunities I'm giving you right now for you to develop, for you to be ready for marriage when it comes later, for, for you to, do your, to be your best you right now because you are a whole person in Christ. Somebody better give God some praise up in here. I want to ask you another question. Could you be in a season where instead of you being married to somebody, God wants you to be taking care of somebody like Ruth? Here Ruth was in the prime of her life, and she's taking care of her mother-in-law. And you've got to be content with that. You've got to know when God has told you that hey, this is a season where I need you to focus on somebody else, taking care of somebody. And if you're not content with that, then you'll tend to do things that are inappropriate. You'll tend to disobey God. You'll tend to get manipulative in, in your situations and start doing things out of the will of God because you're so afraid that I'm going to miss out on something. And, I, you know, if, if he says to have sex with him, I'll have sex with him because I'm not going to lose him. And so God says it's so important that we learn to be content and walk in the purpose that he has for us. Not only your purpose, but here's another one real quick, your attraction. Your attraction. Watch your attraction. Make sure you prioritize godly character as the main thing you are attracted to and the main thing you are looking for. See, both Boaz and Ruth, they had godly character. And the thing that was drawing him to her and the thing that was drawing her to him was their godly character, their kindness, their love, their generosity. What you want to do is you want to find a man, you want to find a woman who really displays the qualities of God. If they don't display the qualities of God, they display a heart to want to be more like God. 
They want to be loving. They want to be gracious. They want to be patient. They want to be kind. They want to be those things that God calls them to be. Look in verse 8 of Ruth chapter 2. Boaz is having an initial conversation with Ruth. And notice what they're observing about each other. Verse 8, then Boaz said to Ruth, you will listen, my daughter, will you not? Do not go to glean in another field, nor go from here, but stay close by my young women. So Ruth is checking all of this out. She's seeing that he's a caring man. He's a giver. He's not a taker. Ladies, I said he's a giver. He's not a taker. Verse 9, let your eyes be on the field which they reap and go after them. Have I not commanded, I've insisted with the young men who work in my company that they're not going to harass you, they're not going to do anything inappropriate to you. She saw how he was a protector. She saw how he treated women with respect. He wanted to make sure they were honored. He had that chivalry thing going on. I mean, you got to understand that God has called us as kingdom men, Christian men, to honor women. And so you have to be careful how you engage a woman. You have to be careful about singling out a woman. One of the things that you don't find from a biblical standpoint of how we do relationships and dating, you don't find men singling out women for casual recreational purposes. For all practical purposes, you really don't find dating from the Western world standpoint in the Bible. It, it's, it doesn't, it's not a concept. This is not how they dealt with matching people together. They had two primary ways in which they matched people together. And both ways had to do with extraordinary community. In other words, it wasn't a couple just operating in isolation. No, don't tell nobody this is our business. No, it wasn't none of that. It was done in community. One of the ways they did it was by arranged marriages. You had families engaged in this for years, sometimes as much as a decade, preparing this, preparing the children. Another way they did, what we would probably call it a courtship, is where a young man would engage the family. And when he engaged the family, he would not engage the young lady first. He would engage the father. And they would enter into a communal relationship between those two families where he's sharing his intentions. And if that went well, they would go through this thing called a betrothal, which was kind of like an engagement, where he would pay a price for the opportunity to be able to marry her at a later time as he prepared, where he would make a public vow, which is probably similar to what a man does in our society when he gets on his knee and he puts a ring on her finger, something very public, something costing him something to acknowledge his interest, and he really wants to go forward with this. And so there, this is a betrothal or as we had arranged marriages, but you didn't have men just going up to women saying, hey, you know what, can we go out tonight? Because what you have to understand about women, men, is that we are called to protect them not only physically, but their emotions. And God has designed women where they has designed women where they desire to be in a relationship with one person who is captivated with them, who loves them, who's gonna honor them for a lifetime. And so when a man asks a woman into one-on-one relationship, you're sending a message to her. And you'll be out on the date, and you've had the date, and You're just thinking real simple about it, and she's thinking real deep. She may not say it out loud. You saying, hey, McDonald's was good, okay. The burger and the fries were warm. I had a good time. And she's over there thinking, I want my bridesmaids to wear royal blue. So you, you, you can't handle one-on-one relationships with women casually like that. You have to take it very seriously when you decide to pull that trigger and say, hey, I see you, and I want to exclusively walk with you and be with you. You got to be very careful. And we picked up some stuff from the world. We watch these hip-hop uh, videos, and we watch all these rappers, and they talking about how they go to the club, and they make it rain, and how they pick up a woman and all this, and we learn, and we learn stuff from the world. And guess what? It's not working for them either. It's not working for them. And so God wants us to be very, very careful when we engage a young lady. And so they're showing all of these wonderful qualities. And so it says here in verse 9 of Ruth chapter 2, When you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink from what the young men have drawn. She's seen his generosity. Ladies, she's seen his generosity. When he takes you out for the first time and he's making you pay for the meal, watch out. Dead giveaway. 
Yeah. Yeah, I've talked to brothers. Sometimes they don't understand kingdom, what it means to cover a woman. Okay, they, they, uh, they even got married, and they talk about, hey, you know, her money, my money, that's her debt. That's her mistake. She brought all that into the marriage. She's going to have to pay for that herself. They have no idea what it means to be a Boaz, to be a kingdom man, to cover a woman. You cover a woman, when you become one flesh, you become one flesh, even in your finances. What's yours is mine, what's mine is yours. And as the man who covers, you have to cover her in her weaknesses. This is why the Bible says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loves the church. Well, understand, when did Christ love the church? When does he cover us? He covered us when we were sinful. If you are not willing to cover your wife in her flaws, her weaknesses, her mistakes, that's not even biblical covering. And so you have to understand what God is saying here. And then look at this. It says in verse 10, so she fell on her face and she bowed down to the ground and said to him, why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me since I am a foreigner? Look, she saw how he was not a man to judge a person by their race or by their character or by the outward things that were going on. Verse 11, Boaz answered and said to her, it has been fully reported to me all that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband and how you have left your father and your mother in the land of your birth and have come to a people whom you did not know before. So Boaz saw in her her loyalty to family. He saw how she was responsible, how she was hardworking, how she had a heart to serve the people that she loved, how she had a heart to sacrifice for the people that she loved. He saw her resilience to stay faithful to God even when her husband died. Stay faithful to God even when her mother-in-law is dealing with bitterness. To stay with her mother-in-law, to help her mother-in-law. To stay faithful to God when life falls apart. He saw all these character qualities in her and it just blew him away. He says in verse 12, the Lord repay your work and a full reward be given by the Lord God of Israel under whose wings you have come for refuge. And may I say this to my single brothers and sisters. As you walk with the Lord, he puts you under the covering of his wing. He's going to take care of you. He's going to comfort you. He's going to be there for you. Then she said, let me find favor in your sight, verse 13, and have spoken, for you have comforted me and have spoken kindly. And she saw how he was an encouraging man and not a man who would tear you down with his tongue. And so she said, I am not like one of your maidservants and you've spoken kindly to me. She saw how Boaz was a safe man. Ladies, let me say something to you. It may take a little longer than what you like, but there are safe men out there, amen? amen. So you don't have to compromise, amen? amen. And, and you should have a physical attraction. You want your main attraction to be spiritual, but you should have a physical attraction. Because here's what you gotta understand about. <laughs> Come on up here. Come on up here, help me preach this. <laughs> she might as well say, are you out of your mind, Pastor? Of course, that's right, man. <laughs> but did you know that physical attraction can change as you get to know a person? I mean, people will change the way they look when you just really take the time to look at them and spend time with them. And this is why you want to be very careful about saying, I won't go out with somebody. If they are a godly man, a godly woman, hey, be careful about those lists that you have. Uh, you know. Ladies, when, when, when your friends say, hey, what about Robert? Girl, don't even bring up Robert. <laughs> you know I don't like husky men. <laughs> or, you know I don't like short men. It got quieter there, didn't it? <laughs> You're going to miss your blessing. <laughs> men... When somebody say, hey, man, what about Sandra? Sandra would be good for you. Man, don't even talk to me about Sandra. You know that's not my type. Listen, if they are godly, you may want to try to just at least go out with them once. Stay open. I have seen this happen. I have seen God change a person's heart toward a person just by staying open to the Lord. And see, here's the danger. You will miss what God's trying to give you. <laughs> Remember what we learned from David? We learn from David, we learn many things from David, but one of the things we learn from David is that God does not look at the outward appearance, but he looks at the heart. 1 Samuel 16. Remember where we learned that? 
It was a time when Samuel was told he was supposed to anoint one of Jesse's children, one of Jesse's sons, to be a king. And so Samuel went to Jesse's house. And Jesse had all of his sons there except for David. David was still out in the field. Jesse didn't even bother to call David in. Because David was so young, he was ruddy looking, he was still a kid. And he brought the young men who were basically adults, young adults, mature. They had even fought in some battles. He brought those men before Samuel. One by one, he paraded these good-looking young men, strong-looking young men, handsome young men towards Samuel. And Samuel just wasn't feeling in his spirit. He's praying. God's not giving him a release or, or freedom. And he says, there's got to be somebody else. Is there somebody else? And Jesse sends for David. And David comes in, and God speaks to Samuel, that's the one, anoint him. They almost missed the king because they were looking at the outward appearance. Ladies, don't miss your king looking at the outward appearance. Men, don't miss your queen looking at the outward appearance. Let's bow together. And Jesus, we pray that we would not miss the King of Kings <laughs> and the Lord of Lords. Help us to seek first your kingdom and your righteousness, knowing that everything else will be added. So if you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus, would you do that today? It starts with that. We have to get our vertical relationship with God together before we can get our horizontal relationships with people together. And there may be someone here where you've been just making your way through life, in and out of church, around Christianity, even feeling like you are a Christian, but if you really did a deep dive, a deep probing of your heart, you've never committed your life to Jesus. And you don't have to be mad about that. You don't have to feel shame about that. That happens, and especially when we grow up in it. But he's calling you to a personal relationship, and let me tell you how you can enter into that relationship. Jesus Christ is God himself. And he took on the form of man and he came to our world. And yet he does not have sin. He did not have sin. And when he shed his blood, he shed his sinless blood that could pay for your sins and my sins. And it goes like this. He said it like this. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So if you really believe in Jesus, you will not perish, but you will have everlasting life. Now, what does it, does it mean to believe? Does it mean you just give mental assent? Is it just a mental thing? Uh, yeah, I believe that about Jesus. I believe he was God. No, it's more than that. It's a giving of all of yourself believing. It's a giving of the heart. You're supposed to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength, everything in you. That's what it means to believe. And maybe you've never done that, and he's calling you to do that today. Because that believing means you have to surrender your life to him and make him your Lord. If that's you, I want to lead you in a prayer. If that's you online, I want to lead you in a prayer. Just pray this prayer. Dear Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. Say that to him. Dear Jesus, say this. I acknowledge that I'm a sinner. And I open my heart to you, Jesus. Say that. I open my heart to you, Jesus. I invite you in fully completely say that fully completely I invite you into my heart I invite you to sit on the throne of my heart and be my Lord say Jesus I repent of my sins that's a fancy way of saying I turn away from what I've been doing wrong and I turn toward you I repent of my sins in this moment and I come to you I know you will help me to walk right. Say that. I know you will help me to walk right. Say thank you, Jesus, for saving me. I believe in you in this moment.